Kia ora, everyone. It's just been um, uh, up at Starting Point meeting some of our, our new people. Uh, it's just exciting to hear some of their stories and, and what God is doing. I, I think we should um, uh, thank those of you that have been inviting new people late, lately because just their stories, we're all connected to invites from different people here. So uh, I think we can show our gratitude to the way some of you are stepping out and inviting people. Uh, November is party central in the Dove household. Uh, we have three birthdays in like a, a couple of week, uh, a two-week span. So Elisha, my youngest son, turned nine this past Friday. Chase turns 11 tomorrow. Robin turns, <laughs> no, I'm smarter than that. She turns like, you know, 33 um, in uh, a week's time. Uh, we, and we Doves love to party. In fact, on the night before Elisha's birthday, uh, this last Thursday, now we call it Birthday Eve in the Dove household. Uh, I sat down with, with my kids and I asked them, you know, can, can you tell me the various components that go into a good party? My girls were like straight off the bat, you know, they said friends, you know, the opportunity just to catch up with my friends and to meet new people if I met at somebody else's party. Uh, both girls continued talking about the need for a really good attitude to really get into the celebration. I have no idea where they came from, but I was super impressed. Then my boys jumped in. Uh, Chase mentioned drift karting makes like the best party around. Pinata is absolutely necessary. And of course, food. Uh, cupcakes are the new baseline for all parties. And obviously to top it off, cake. But it can't just be like any old cake. It has to be this creative masterpiece. Without that, maybe something, but it ain't a party. Now a lot of us, as we get older, uh, find it hard, don't we, to put the word celebrate and birthday together. We kind of want to pretend it's not our birthday. We don't really want to celebrate. But in fact, when you open the Bible, you find uh, ample reasons for celebration, and you actually find it's biblical to celebrate. And, and today, we're going to discover more about a massive celebration that God's people held once a year. It wasn't a birthday party, but it was held just once a year. And it was all about learning to be grateful and coming to express gratefulness to God every single year. You see, God established these different rhythms and seasons into the life of His people. And, and there were three really big festivals. The first of those, you might know this one, was Passover. It happens about March, April next year, always timed with just after the barley harvest, uh, kind of Israel, it's, it's spring. And then you have Pentecost, about 50 days just after Passover. It was just after the grain harvest of summertime in Israel. And then the one we're talking about today is called Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Shelters, or by the Hebrew name Sukkot. The thing I find really interesting is most Christians I meet know quite a lot about Passover, a little bit about um, Pentecost, but very little about Tabernacles. And the interesting thing about that is, for Israel, this is like the big festival. In fact, many of them call it the feast, because, well, this is the feast. This is the most extravagant one to come to. And I think it's this Feast of Tabernacles that actually gives language and words to help us know what gratefulness is all about. So this week, I sat down with Rabbi Nathaniel from the Auckland Hebrew Synagogue, and I, I asked him a whole bunch of questions and so we've got some videos as I chatted with him this week. Let's see what he says. First of all, from Leviticus chapter 23. Then you shall take for yourself on the first day the fruit of the citron tree, the branches of the date palm, twigs of plated tree, and brook willows. You shall rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven-day period. You shall celebrate it as a festival for Hashem, a seven-day period in, in the year, an internal decree for your generation. In the seventh month, you shall celebrate it. You shall dwell in Booth for a seven-day period. Every native in Israel shall dwell in Booth, so that ge generations will know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in Booth when I took them from the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. Yeah, I think the message um, of, of the Festival of Tabernacle is so, it's such a contemporary message, even in our times, especially when life has all become so busy. And we are so uh, um, focused on how much we're going to earn. And this is the festival of gathering. A person should feel 
after he gathered all the crops and, and the fruits and everything into his house. Oh, my God, it's all because of me, because I'm so smart. And this festival is all about humbleness. Go outside. Go from your mansion. Go from your big house. Forget about your bank account. Go and sit under the stars and see that everything is actually so temporary in this world. Make sure that your life is full of meaning. And this is, should be your real bank account and nothing else matter. So we'll hear more from the rabbi shortly, but from our conversation, I, I jotted down five components about this Feast of Tabernacles. So, you know, and this festival is not, you know, birthday cake and drift carts and things like that. It's, it's these other five uh, characteristics. The first one I want us to think about are time and cost in this expression of gratitude. Because God was really clear about this in both Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus. He says to the people, you must observe the festival of shelters for seven days. Now, just get your head around this for a minute. God is instigating a week-long party. Now, have you ever met people who have a stern mental picture about God, particularly their perspective of the God of the Old Testament? Because here, God's actually commanding his people to celebrate together. So if you're like me and you love a good party, you're in good company with our, our God. Because this wasn't just like a normal party that lasted even just a couple of hours. This was, and it wasn't even just like Thanksgiving or Christmas where you have like a whole day to celebrate. But this is, what, seven days. A whole week, an entire week, God tells his people to take the week off. This is a big deal. And remember, this is at a time when the people lived, you know, hand to mouth. It was this agrarian society. So to stop producing, to stop work, and to get away, this was a big, big deal. And in fact, uh, at that time, there's no like air flights, obviously, and no vehicles around. So to, to get to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival for a whole week, you had to even travel for many, many days there and many days back. So you were often away for two or three weeks. During that time, you're not producing. During that time, you have to trust that God will provide for you and will protect your farm and your household while you're away. This is a big, big deal, but this is so important to God. In fact, it was so important to God that he even asked his people to tithe for these festivals. You know, set aside 10% of their income for their travel costs and for any costs that would be involved in celebrating during this festival and for the other two festivals. Now, just even think about that, how much money you earn and tithe that amount. Uh, this was how much was going set aside just to celebrate in these extravagant moments, in addition to the other tithes that God asks his people to give. Over the course of the week, there would be numerous animals that were sacrificed, including 70 bulls, more than in any other season, festival, or sacrificial part. And effectively, this becomes like this huge barbecue where all the people gather around and enjoy dining together, thanking God for what he's provided for them. Are you beginning to see how utterly important gratitude is to the heart of God? You know, because it's, it's easy, isn't it, to to just get in this habit of producing and working and working and moving from task to task to to-do list. And God just asks us to set aside an extravagant amount of time and resources to say, thank you, God, for who you are and for what you're doing. Last week, I, I challenged us to move away from this idea of gratitude to actually practicing gratitude. And I, I challenge you to, to uh, write down three specifics in a journal or on social media to think about the things God is doing in your life. And so some people went on social media and used that hashtag GCC Grateful and love some of the things that people have written down. Uh, so Isaac writes, uh, today I'm thankful for being older because many would deny that opportunity. You know, the aching joints notwithstanding, I'm still here. I love that. You know, even something, you know, as we get older, we kind of feel it, don't we? But to actually just to kind of turn that around and use it as an opportunity to praise God and think about the goodness of God even in the way that we can age. And so how are you doing with your, with your list? Uh, you know, a lot of you are up to like number 21. Some of you have got like extra credit. But I want to encourage you to keep journaling through that, to move from just the idea to actually put some habits in your life 
where you pause and thank God for what He's doing. Time and cost, one of those five components. Here's another one of the components that relates to this festival. It's booths. The people lived in these shelters or booths. They slept in situations just like this. And again, the rabbi has a few comments to make around these, these tabernacles. Let's listen to what he has to say. The Torah commanded us to a uh, seven day a year, um, three days after the Day of Atonement, after Yom Kippur, to go outside and build a sukkah. What is a sukkah? The walls of the sukkah can be from any material, but the most important part of the sukkah is actually the roof. And the roof has to come from a natural material, usually from leaves, palm trees, or, or anything that is made from nature and, and not processed. Um, and that's a constant reminder to look up. The sukkah means, uh, 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 sukkah goes after the Hebrew name for roof, which is chach. So the Torah expects us to look up all the time, to look up and remember who is your ultimate protection. And of course, God is our ultimate protection. And as long as we remember, remember this, then we know that everything that happens for us is actually good. And so they would make these uh, makeshift uh, tabernacles, sukkahs, uh, booths to sleep in overnight for each of the seven days during this festival. And in fact, the rabbi said to me uh, between filming, and he said, you know, this was like, as a kid, I, I loved this time because we got to like camp outside, you know, staring up at the stars. It was like the, the, the most awesome of times. Uh, and so you kind of look at this and you go, well, why would God have the people do this? Well, it's really clear, uh, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, we read this. Uh, the next verse up there, it says, um, from Leviticus 23, this will remind each new generation of Israelites that I made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So there's a bigger story going on here. It's a story back when, at one time, the people of God lived in Egypt, and they were slaves when they lived in Egypt. But through uh, the 10 uh, plagues, God moved his people. He, he redeemed them. He, set, he, he rescued them from slavery and brought them through the Red Sea. And then they lived in the wilderness for like 40 years. And, and in the wilderness, they lived in shelters and, and tents and, and booths and lean-tos. That's how they lived for those 40 years. And so the reason they do this during this seven-day period is to remember that God had rescued them. And God provided everything they needed during those wilderness years. He wanted them to pause and to express their gratitude for what they had and for what they have. So you've got time, you've got booths. There's another characteristic of festivals, and it's produce. You see, the timing of the festival coincided with the end of the grape season and olive season. This is what we read in Deuteronomy. For seven days, you must celebrate this festival to honor the Lord your God at the place He chooses, for it is He who blesses you with bountiful harvests and gives you success in all your work. This festival will be a time of great joy for all. So, you know, the people would come along, and uh, they have just um, been in the vineyards, and they have picked these grapes, and they, you know, eating the grapes, I guess, as they're walking along, and they're just enjoying, excuse me, what they have. It's good. Um, and then there were some um, olives as well, and, and olives for them wasn't just uh, a food that you ate, uh, but olives would be turned into oil for, uh, for the lamps at night. It was used as a, uh, in cosmetics and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, around them, they've just been reminded, God has provided for us. And with our produce, we, we, we want to say, God, thank you for the way you have provided uh, uh, water for us again, and you have uh, grown um, our crops, and you have provided the food that we need for this current season and for the year ahead. And we're just coming to say, thank you. Now, as they're doing that, they're also thinking about the way God provided manna for them when they were in the wilderness. God kept providing for them. You see, it's kind of practices like this that help remind the people, because God knows His people always seem to forget the way God is so good to us. In fact, even before the people of Israel 
uh, move from the wilderness into the promised land. Uh, God said to them through Moses, he said, the Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when you made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig, and you will eat vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. And when you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. God knows how easy it is for us to forget. And he knows how easy it is for us to develop that sense of entitlement, thinking that we deserve all these things. He knows how we can begin to focus on what's going wrong so that we become grumpy. He knows how easy it is for us to worry about what might go wrong so that we become anxious, that we begin to see what's going right for everyone else so that we become envious. See, all these things are are linked to ingratitude. And ingratitude happens to us when we forget what we have and we forget the goodness of God right in our present situation. When there is little or no gratitude, these negative traits begin to grow. I spoke about this last week, right? When gratitude gets smaller and smaller, grumpiness and anxiety and envy get bigger and bigger and bigger. The opposite is also true. When gratitude gets bigger, these other things become less apparent in our lives. They're like incompatible roommates. One exists, the other can't coexist in that same room uh, with the other traits as well. This is why God causes people to take time to be grateful. Yes, they always have something to grumble about because things are always going wrong, but instead he wants his people to practice the art of gratefulness, seeing God's presence and goodness all around them because he knows that gratitude has the power to move us from grumbling to joy. Yes, the people could be anxious about the season ahead. You know, is, are the crops going to grow? Is there going to be enough rain? But God knows the power of gratitude to move us from anxiety towards peace. And yes, it would be natural for these people to be envious about whatever their neighbor had, you know, the latest plow in the field or whatever it would be. But again, God knows the power to move us from envy to contentment or because of gratitude. So included in this community obviously would have been people that are going through a really tough year. And God wants all people to sit back and remember the goodness of God to them, to train their retinas to to see God and to see what He's doing to help them as they think about the year ahead, just as He wants some of you to do today. Because some of you have just come out of a desert experience, haven't you? you? You were facing a bankruptcy and God provided for you, or you were facing a health challenge and God heals you. Or, or you were struggling with, with loneliness at school and, and, and you made a friend through the least expected place. You were going through infertility and God increased your family, maybe in ways that you weren't expecting. You moved through depression and you've come out on the other side with less and less clouds. Uh, or your marriage is in a better state, there's kind of less fighting and you've actually learned to like each other more than dislike each other. See, God says, remember Remember, but be grateful for what I have given to you and allow your readiness to change. See, perhaps some of you this week need to find some Sukkot or some equivalent of it just to sit there and to look up and to thank God and to take even extravagant times and just thank Him for the, for the produce that's in front of you, whatever that produce might be, and to pause and to give thanks and to remember. So there's time, there's booths, there's produce. Here's another component on the festival. It's community. Be grateful for a place to belong. See, many people in our city, you've probably seen this, haven't you? Just incredible loneliness. And and this happened in ancient times too. And one of the things I love about this festival is the way it sought to provide a place where everybody could come and belong. Listen to these words from Deuteronomy 16. This festival will be a happy time of celebrating with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites, 
foreigners, orphans, and widows from your towns. Everybody was invited, and there was a place for everybody in the Sukkots that people would make. Okay, let's listen to what the rabbi has to say. So in, in another place, mentioning the, the festival of Sukkot, it says that you shall celebrate with every part of the nation, with your servant, your maid servant, your convert. Everybody is welcome under the same schach, under the same roof. There's plenty room, even though the sukkah can be a, a something a very, very small. But the idea is that the sukkah should welcome everybody under the same roof. And so this was an inclusive community, a place where, where foreigners and the most um, vulnerable in society could come and be included, and they would find a place under the Sukkot with others. So it was a party for everybody. Now, I'd imagine some of the people at that time didn't feel like celebrating. You know, joy was the last thing in their minds, and so the rest of the community, it was their job to kind of drag this person into Jerusalem to come and participate in this festival, to, to come and actually see God is present in your life, and there are reasons for you to still be grateful, even when they were kind of dragging their heels. You see, the rest of the community had been blessed in order to be a blessing to others, and so they were going to stand up and try to help other people come and be part of the community as well. So a question for us. I mean, who's in your orbit right now? that isn't connected. Because what we believe is God has placed you right where you are. He's blessed you in order that you would be a blessing to that community. It might be in your neighborhood with that neighbor that you have. It might be uh, at work with that particular colleague that you have. It might be even where you're sitting today and you hear of a need. And, and who's responsible to step into that? Well, it's you. God has placed you right where you are in order for you to include them and to reach out to them and be a blessing to them. And you see, this is the time of the year where it's actually really easy to include people. You know, summertime, you know, apart from a bit of rain earlier, you know, great time to get a barbecue out. You know, I'm having a barbecue lunch today, you know, looking forward to getting together with other friends, you know, inviting people to services. You know, as you heard earlier, in a month's time, we have this Christmas presentation called A Christmas Wish. Easiest ask to, to get people along to that. But to find ways to see you serve even the most vulnerable. I love the way there's all these renew groups happening at the moment. Emily Anderson's doing an amazing job of this. So last Wednesday night, I, I bumped into a few of them um, at the CBD. I think there's a photo up here uh, of, of a group, all GCCers working with um, New Z uh, uh, Humanity and Z, just feeding um, homeless uh, on a Wednesday night once a month. Uh, or you have uh, Julie, Julie MacArthur's uh, Renew group, uh, sewing, making different uh, things to pass out or, or to, to sell to others, all the proceeds going towards uh, the most vulnerable caught up in sex trafficking in our world. Love these initiatives. Um, and because serving is such a good thing to do. Uh, as a staff, on um, Tuesday morning, we got up really early uh, to make lunches at Eat My Lunch. So we were there like, some crazy 6 a.m. hour, and by 9 o'clock, we had made a 1,000 sandwiches. I'm an artistic person now, taking that knife and putting, you know, margarine on each of those sandwiches. It's a great thing to do because we had such a blast together as we get to serve the most vulnerable in our city. And if you're looking for a place to belong, one of the best ways you can do that is just to join different groups like this uh, or one of our small groups, and you can find out some information even, even at the information desk after the service. This is the community of faith coming together to make sure there's a place for everybody to belong. One final component of this festival. Time, booths, produce, community. The last ones are water and light. Grateful for provision and protection. See, there are a couple of reenactment activities and though we don't read about them back in the Old Testament, we know they happened really early on because they were well established before the time of Jesus. And the first ritual was this, this water ritual. On the seventh day, remember there's seven days as part of this festival. On the last day, it's often the, the climax of the festival, we read that the high priest would 
would take a, a jar and he would go to the pool of Siloam and, and he would fill up the, the jug and he would, he would lead this processional and all the, all the people of God would be um, behind him and they would be singing away. And, and, and their right hand, what was called a lulavav, the picture on the screen is made of different branches, four species coming together and they, they would hold this branch and they'd be waving that and then in their left hand, they would hold some citrus and uh, they're just saying, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. And the, and, and the high priest is walking in front of them with, with his water. And, and then he would get to the altar. And as they're kind of uh, praising God and just kind of caught up in the festivities, he, he would begin to pour the water over the altar. And the water was symbolic of, of the way God had brought rain to water their crops, which is what they're holding in their hands from, from those trees and from the citrus. And the water was reminding them about the way God brought water from the rock as they walked through the wilderness. God providing, God providing, God providing. And the people were full of joy. That was the first ritual, the water ritual. And then there was another reenactment activity uh, involving four huge lamps. So in the um, uh, area of the temple court, uh, often known as the court of the woman, it was um, accessible to all people, there were these four big torches that would be lit at night. And, and apparently, um, historians from that time would talk about how all of Jerusalem would, would be illuminated by these four massive lamps. And, and under those lamps, on the final night of the festival, um, people would be dancing and they'd be singing. You can imagine all these worship bands coming along and people kind of just dancing to the, to the worshipers. They're caught up in awe of who God is and just loving this moment. In fact, we read that even the, the rabbis of that time, you know, with their, with their long beards and, and their robes, you know, often looked a bit serious, but at this time, they're out there, they're like dancing away, and, and many of them would stay up the entire night, just caught up with joy of what's happening. Now, um, this was the last night. This was an amazing night for the people to come together. Listen to, again to what the rabbi has to say about this final night. The other element that we have on the festival, which is we haven't mentioned yet, is also the last waters that were in Jerusalem were sacrificed the, um, on the altar. So the Shiloh, one of the, the, the fountains that supply the entire water system into Jerusalem, and, it, and again, usually uh, support in the land of Israel is just really at the end of the summer, basically before we pray for rain. And um, we're taking the last water, same as we're taking at the last day of the festival, we're taking the willow, and we dance with just the willow. Um, two ways. On the one hand, we pray, we say to, to God, we need the rain. Like, we are like the willow. We, we, one, one moment without the, the water, we're gone, right? Symbolize that also, without God, without the Torah, without being connected to the divine, we are withering, like the willow. And also, that correspondence, the water is, is our life. Water is life. In order to be connected, we need to be connected to the divine all the time. So there were lights and there were fire and kind of a whole, a, a whole parade to complete rejoice. And the, the Talmud um, says that a person who never saw the rejoicement during that time never saw a, 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 an amazing party in his life. That's the comparison. So the, it was a true rejoicement that unfortunately today we don't have since the destruction of the temple. So you're starting to get the idea, aren't you, that, I mean, this is a, an amazing climax of the whole week-long festival. You know, all this dancing and activity. You know, some of you kind of want to get up already and start to kind of, kind of move with, with the excitement of what was happening at that very moment. Now, the, the rabbi mentioned, you know, that doesn't happen anymore, the dancing or fire, because there isn't a temple anymore. But you see, friends, this is where it gets even better for us as followers of Messiah Jesus. Because Jesus was a Jew who obediently participated in the festival of tabernacles. Uh, he actually lived in one of these booths, you know, year and year after, uh, you know, during his time. Uh, and in John 7 and 8, we read that he attended the week of this festival. This is what it says. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee... He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. 
But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, so remember, tuck this away, it's right in the context of, of this festival. And then Jesus goes on to say something, and, and you don't really understand how important this is until you understand festivals. Because we read, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds. Now again, before we read what he has to, to yell out to everyone about, Remember, this is the last day of this um, festival, the climax of it all. The water ritual has just happened. So, so the high priest has been there. He's poured water from the pool of Siloam. The people have seen that. They're remembering the time in the wilderness. They're remembering the way God has brought rain on their crops. They're kind of celebrating, dancing the night before. And in that context, Jesus says this. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. I mean, friends, do you hear what Jesus is saying? Just as God provided water for his people in the wilderness, just like God has provided rain for the crops, God is inviting people to come to Jesus. That Jesus is now the one who provides true water from heaven that quenches the ultimate thirst. He is the one, the only one, that provides us with all the sustenance we need in life. See, all of us crave satisfaction. Uh, All of us have moments where we pursue happiness in wrong places, in a relationship or through work or stuff or some reputation or whatever, and we kind of go off the rails. And Jesus says, no, 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 you can come and find your thirst quenched in a personal and ongoing relationship with me, Jesus. And as we enter into that relationship, the Spirit of God comes to reside in us, which is what Jesus meant by these living waters. And the reason I know that is because John goes on. He says, when Jesus said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. So the water that Jesus brings is the very presence of the Spirit of God. God at work in our lives. That's why we don't need to go to a temple anymore because, well, Jesus is the temple and and the Spirit of God resides in us. We are the temple of God. Wherever we go, we can celebrate. We don't need to wait once a year for this festival to come around because wherever we go, We have the Spirit of God bringing everything we need for our nourishment and sustenance. Jesus has one other thing in the context of this festival. Again, on the final day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, remember on that final night, there was all these, you know, big um, gas lights kind of all burning throughout. Um, the particular area was the court of, of women, accessible to everyone. And, and so, where's Jesus standing? Well, in the next verse, we read this here. It says, uh, Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury. The treasury, or those offering receptacles, were placed in the court of the woman, the place where everybody could come, the place where those four lamps were lit and had been lit the night before. So in the same place, the the, the place that still has the, the smell of last night's oil still lingering in the air, with all the memories of the people as people have danced under those very lights throughout the night, Jesus proclaims loud and clear, I am the light of the world. And these Jewish people knew exactly what he meant. It was as if he was saying, I am the glory of the pillar of cloud that your ancestors followed by day and the pillar of fire by night. I am the Shekinah that descended into this world. I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you will never, ever be in darkness again. See, friends, you don't need to meet in some temple anymore to celebrate once a year. He said, every moment as you follow after Jesus, 
I mean, and when it's like you're in the wilderness and you're following the pillar of fire, Jesus says, you know, whoever follows me, it draws on that same image that you would be following this, this pillar of fire, which is now Jesus himself, following what he has to say. He is our guide. He is our protector. For those who are feeling lost today, maybe you still feel like you're just in the, this wilderness period, surrounded by darkness. And Jesus yells out to you today, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I mean, these are huge claims, big claims by a big God. And we can have confidence in receiving these things today because they are given to us by Jesus. So friends, you might just want to put yourself in a posture right now as we pray. You know, I just find putting my hands out to, to receive as helpful as we pray. And as you do that, listen again to Jesus' words. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Just put your hands out as we pray together. I'm going to pray the most ancient of prayers by the early church. Just three words. Come Holy Spirit. And we pray not because we don't believe the Spirit's already here, but because we want to be attentive to what He's saying to us. Attentive to remember that God is here by His Spirit, sustaining our lives, providing every good thing that we need. Just talk to him. Just thank him. So come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We come thirsty. Our souls are parched from, for many here, tough weeks. But thank you, Spirit of God, that you are living water. You quench the, the thirst that we have. You sustain us. You nourish us. You provide us with life, life eternal. Father, we say that we're sorry for the way that we so often and regularly seek after other things to bring happiness and sustenance. But right now we want to say to you again that we need you. We need your spirit to fill us, to nourish us. And we take this moment just to say, thank you. We're so grateful for everything you provided for us and grateful for your spirit that resides within. Now, I'm aware you might be here and you've never actually spoken to God before today. And so this invitation that Jesus gave to his people then is the same invitation for you personally today. So what's holding you back? You know, this is your moment right now to cross that line of faith. If you're willing to step over that line. You might want to follow me as I pray. Uh, Jesus, you invite everybody and anybody to come into your family, regardless of what any of us have done. <laughs> Thank you for your amazing grace and mercy. And so I come again today. I come to you, thanking you for who you are, Pray that you would receive me into your family. And come, Holy Spirit. Come reside in my life, transforming me from inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I wonder if we can stand together. You know, this feast was not um, some melancholic event. 
You probably picked up already that this feast was like a loud, exuberant, extravagant time of partying, of celebrating the goodness and grace of God. God had been utterly good to them, and the people were so caught up in joy. And the levels of joy apparently were unparalleled. In fact, um, the rabbi mentioned this in, in the video. He's quoting from the Jewish Talmud, uh, you know, when that water ride is happening. And, and, and this is what the Talmud says. The one who had never witnessed the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing had never seen true joy in his life. Because you're so caught up in awe and wonder at who God is. Gratitude is powerful and it's personal. And, and we find these grateful words. It, it gives us now this opportunity to, to show gratefulness to, to our families and, and, our, and our workplaces and our neighborhoods, but also right here, right now. As we sing our final song, it's this opportunity to just express our joy to God and declare again, there is freedom in Him. I'm free, the song says, I'm free, I'm free to dance and sing. Our Nigerian community can lead us, right? I'm free to shout it out. I'm free to dance and sing. I'm free to worship you because God has been good. Let's come and express our gratitude to Him this morning.